golden streets were marching. Beautiful, beautiful Zion, we're marching. The beautiful city of God, then let our songs abound and every day we Amen. We're marching through. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fair worlds on high to fair worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful. We're marching the beautiful city of God. Amen. Please be seated. We do not have to necessarily welcome Brother Myron Bruce back. We know him so well. He's an old friend of this congregation. No, no pun intended on old friend. Um, but we're just glad you're here tonight, Myron. It's good to see you standing here and leading singing for us. Uh, it's good to have uh, Vicky back uh, with us as well, and, um, and we're just glad to see every one of you here as well. I'm standing here to introduce our guest speaker this evening, uh, David Shannon. Um, I've known for about 25 years or so, and I think for about the last 30 years, he has had three different jobs. I first met him uh, about 25 years ago when he was preaching for a church in Gadsden, Alabama, and later, not too many years after that, he moved up to Tennessee to Mount Juliet Church of Christ. And uh, there he preached for, uh, I think, close to 20 years, 18 or 20 years. And most recently, uh, David has become the brand new president of Freed Hardeman University. I think he's only been on the job uh, maybe a couple of months or so, roughly. And I can tell you this much, uh, I know he's doing a great job for Freed Hardeman, but I can tell you that as he comes up here and stands here to preach tonight, he's on more comfortable ground than what he's doing right now with Freed Hardeman. He's a preacher, and uh, he's always been a preacher, and now he's a, a preacher who is the president of, of Freed Hardeman University, and I know he's going to do a great job for them. You're going to be uh, impressed by his opening the Word of God and leading us tonight in that, and we look forward to him coming and standing here to speak to us. David, come preach. Good evening. I love Sunday evening worship services. It's my favorite time of the week. There's something about coming toward the end of the close of the Lord's day and being with God's people that are wholly devoted to Him and lifting up your voices and your hearts in praise to Him and then opening up God's Word and bowing your head and praying. There's just something about that time together. I'm thankful to be here with you tonight. Uh, as Jason has mentioned, we go back a few decades, and I'm always appreciative of that relationship. I'm so glad to meet our brother Robert. I've heard so much about him for so many years. I've heard so much about you, the Waterview congregation, through the years, and it truly is an honor to be here. Tonight, from Freed Hardeman, we have about eight or nine of us that are here with you, and I simply say that to say that any questions or concerns that you might have, we have vice presidents here, we have directors of, of admissions, and, and then those working as uh, assistant vice president of advancement. Whatever questions you would have, uh, there are those here that probably work in that very exact field. And so we would love to take the opportunity to just get to know you, uh, to, to visit with you, and we're going on what we call the presidential trek for about three semesters, and we're going to cover a lot of states in the United States. And we're just trying to go out and connect and reconnect with individuals. Uh, Freed Hardeman, among our 14 higher education institutions that are associated with the Churches of Christ, is the oldest of them. And so because of that, no matter where you go, you're always going to find individuals that are associated with Freed Hardeman, whether they're alumni or their parents went there, or their children went there, their grandparents went there, their grandchildren went there, or they had siblings to go there. And so it's neat, no matter where you travel in America, that always is true. And for that part, even around the world, we have about 33 states represented in our enrollment right now in 10 countries. And uh, what we're trying to do is to say we're trying to go around. And, and if we put it just real simply, what we're trying to do is form a relationship that puts a smile on your face. And so we got to thinking about how do you do that? And so we just thought, well, an easy way that you always put a smile on someone's face is you give them 
a Coca-Cola in a glass bottle, iced down. And so right outside your foyer, if you'll go just straight out into your right, you'll see what we call MIC. That's M-I-C, Mobile Information Center. And that's set up out there, and there's Coca-Colas in little glass bottles iced down right now. And so after services, go by and do that. And uh, it's interesting because some of the younger generation comes up each trek, and, and uh, they'll, they'll say, wow, it tastes so much better in a glass bottle. Like the older people knew that, but the younger people were having to learn that. And so we're trying to really put a smile, so it's not a plastic bottle, it's a glass bottle. Then we got thinking, some people are hard sales. And so we thought, what else could we do? So we, we're going to give you a moon pie. How's that? <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's several flavors there, and there are many, M-I-N-I, many moon pies, but we do have many, M-A-N-Y, if you'd like several, uh, you'd be glad to do that. But... When, when I told the team back several months ago we were going to do this, they laughed at me because they thought I was kidding. I said, I'm, I'm not kidding. Now, some people are really hard sales. And so if we're going to travel all over America and make friends with people, we want to be very efficient. How can you make a friend immediately? And there's only one way that I know of to really make a friend immediately, and that is give them bacon on a stick. And so after services tonight, there is bacon on a stick there. This morning, I... Uh, I mentioned that to Louisville this morning, and, uh, you know, they laugh like you. And then after services, people went outside and came back in, and they're chewing. And they're like, you're not kidding. There really is bacon on a stick out there. There really is. And uh, all we want to do is we want to get to know you better. Uh, we want to visit with you. Uh, we want to form that relationship if it's not already formed. And uh, last night in the Star at, at the Dallas Cowboys practice stadium, the McDonald's made it available an elite night, and we had several alumni and friends to come back. And it was a, an amazing time to just connect. And that's all we're trying to do in these treks is just connect with God's people and uh, form those strong relationships. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to read a few passages out of Matthew 13, and then we're going to go back to Ephesians 4. And if you'll give me about three minutes, I want to say just real quickly just a few things about Fried Hardeman. Perhaps the best way that you describe Fried Hardeman is in two words, and that is Christian education. Uh, our Christian roots are deep, and we're unapologetic, and we're thankful for our identity in Christ. As a matter of fact, we're unapologetic, and we're very thankful for our relationship with the Lord's church. Uh, we don't hide the fact that we're associated with the Church of Christ. We hold it up highly. 83% of our students are members of the Church of Christ. We are thankful for that. It creates an environment on campus that is very Christian when we talk about Christian education. And so we have chapel every day, and singing is just amazing. Uh, we have Bible classes on a collegiate level for every student every semester. 100% of our faculty are faithful members of local churches of Christ in the area. We could go on and on talking about how important it is that when young people come to us, our goal is not for them to just survive during that 18 to 22 years of age. We feel like we have failed unless they graduate thriving. We want them to grow every year spiritually that they are with us. Education. Christian education. Uh, we're not going to settle unless it is excellent education. The last 10 years, the trajectory of education at Freed Hardeman has just continually risen, and that's not an opinion, and it's not a feeling, it's a fact. The numbers back it up over and over. Uh, 10 years ago, our, we had 66% uh, of our faculty had their doctorates. Now it's well over 80% have their doctorate in the field that they teach. 90% of our faculty that teach undergraduate courses or full-time faculty. In other words, there's a limited number of adjunct professors. Why? Because full-time professors are devoted to the university where they teach. We have classes that are made up of about 13 and 14 students to the ratio of one teacher. So hear what we're saying here. They're devoted to Christ. They're devoted to the institution. And because the classes are so small, they're devoted to the students. They know them well. They sit beside them in church. They know them and correspond with them and email with them. They know them by name. Now, what does that relate to? That relates to numbers like this. If a student wants to be a doctor, a pre-med major that graduates from Fried Hardeman has a 90% chance of getting accepted into med school. That's far above the national average of about 70%. Pick out any of your large, your large universities and compare where can you have most likelihood to be accepted in professional school. Fred Hardeman is going to top it every time. Pharmacy school acceptance rate, 98%. Most of the other professional schools are 99 or 100% because 
the big schools simply cannot do what high-level education in small classrooms where the people truly care about God, they truly care about the university, and they truly care about each other. And so I just want you to know that there are many choices to choose in education. And what we're asking you to do on this particular trek is we're not asking you to just buy this hook, line, and sinker. We're just asking you, give us a look. It's worth the drive. We have individuals that drive from California. Uh, it's worth the drive. And so we hope that you'll give that a look. And if you're looking for an investment, as maybe you're looking toward the latter part of life, and you want to do something that will go on into generations to come, we're thankful that we have a lot of donors all across America that give generously uh, because they believe in Christian education. And so we're thankful for all those. You know, so much about what we strive to do is to help the kingdom grow. I don't know about you, but I love to see the Lord's kingdom grow. There's not much more that fires me up. As a matter of fact, I can't think of anything that fires me up more than seeing Christ's kingdom grow. What causes the kingdom to grow? Can I illustrate this just a little bit on the lighter side first? I think about years ago, there's a little boy that his dog was going to have a puppy. That's the way he understood it. His dog was going to have a puppy. And so it was close of a winter day, and he noticed that it looked like it was time for his dog to have the, the pup. And so he ran down to the local vet, and the local vet was just leaving his office for the evening. And he says, Doc, you have to come to my house. You have to come. I, I, I think my dog's going to have her puppy, and I don't know what to do. He said, Sure, son, I'll come with you. I walked in a little shed behind the house there. And, uh, and, and the, the doc lit a lantern. And he handed it to the, the boy, and he says, Son, you hold that right there. And the doc got on his knees, and he said, I believe everything's going to be fine. And, and it was. The first puppy was born. The little boy was just beaming. His grin was from ear to ear. He was so excited. He had a dog and a puppy, just like he planned. And to his surprise, a second puppy was born. Well, he hadn't planned on that. And then a third and a fourth and a fifth puppy was born. Now he's holding the lantern, shifting back and forth, foot to foot. And he's thinking, I can't feed this many dogs. I can't take care of this many dogs. And the seventh and eighth and ninth puppy was born. And now he's beside himself. When the tenth puppy was born, you heard, and they were in the dark. And the doc looked around in the darkness story, and he said, son, what are you doing? He said, doc, I think this light's attracting them. Now let's think about that for a moment. We know that there are things that do attract other things. We know that if you go on your back deck on a summer night and it's dark and you turn a porch light on, you know what it's going to attract. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Lord designed the kingdom so that there are aspects of His kingdom that naturally attract people to Him? to the kingdom what is it what is it that attracts people to the lord and what is it that we as god's people ought to do in order to attract those people look with me if you will in matthew the 13th chapter and we see this being written about the kingdom and this is before the church was actually established so in in a sense as this relates and applies to the church this is a prophetic type of teaching you'll notice that most of this chapter is in red this is what jesus is saying you'll notice that most of these parables are very short and you also notice that everyone begins by saying the kingdom of heaven is like now i like it when a teacher teaches like that in other words, when the teacher takes something that I don't understand, and so he begins with something I do understand, and he says, now, if you understand that, the kingdom of heaven is like that. And it's that aha moment. Okay, I can understand that. And so let's look at this short parable. It's only two verses in verse 31 and 32. And he says, another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. What's the kingdom of heaven like? He says the kingdom of heaven is going to be like a mustard seed. It's tiny in its beginning. You know, a mustard seed is so tiny, you could probably put five or ten of them on your thumbnail. They're little bitty. And he says, that's the way the kingdom of heaven's like in the beginning. Go to Acts, the second chapter, and it was small, wasn't it? Uh, is 3,000 small? It is small if you compare it to the world's population. It's small if you see that the great commission that just prefaced that taking place was that the gospel was to be taken to all the world and to every creature. 
So beginning in one place with just 3,000 people, just as Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is small. But what did the Lord intend? The Lord intended for it to never remain small. When that mustard seed grows into a plant, it grows into an herb that's far larger than most any other herbs. As a matter of fact, it's not some little knee-high herb. It grows more like a large bush, so large that you could even call it a tree. And birds can come by and not only light in its branches, but build nests in its branches. And so it goes from a tiny, tiny seed into a very large plant. The church, by design, began very small. But it was to never stop growing. And it's not so a local congregation can boast of numbers. It's because every person has a soul. And every time the church increases, it's more souls that will spend eternity with their God and their Lord. It changes their eternity. But how's this supposed to take place? Well, probably the shortest parable in the Bible is the very next verse. And notice verse 33. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a, man, a, a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leaven. Perhaps all of you have seen dough that has been kneaded and placed into a bowl. But imagine here that the dough is never in contact with the leaven. Imagine you keep the yeast or the leaven up in the cabinet. You keep the dough in the bowl. And you leave for a few hours. And you come back, and what do you see? It really hasn't changed any, except maybe it started to dry out a little bit. And it might, in that sense, be just a little smaller. But it's not a big change. But you see, that's not what happened here. Here, in the previous two verses, he says, my plan for the kingdom is to always be growing. Well, Lord, how do you expect your kingdom to grow? He says, oh, well, let me tell you another parable. In this parable, I'm going to show you the need for contact. What if you mix up that dough, and then you take and you reach for the leaven, and you put it in contact with the dough, and you come back in a few hours, what do you see? My mother has made two recipes of sourdough bread for decades. That's 12 loaves a week. I can't tell you the number of times I've come into the kitchen and the dough has risen to the top of the bowl and it's about to spill over. The only reason that kind of increase exists is because the dough and the leaven have made contact with each other. Lord, what's your plan for the world to be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And His plan is for His church to go out and make contact with the world, to share the gospel of Jesus with them so that there will be great, con great increase. But Lord... What if we don't do it? What's your plan B? And it's a startling and sober thing to accept that God doesn't have a plan B. He's not sending Moses back. Read the Bible cover to cover. He's not sending the prophets back. He's not sending Jesus back to walk on this earth and teach. He's not sending the apostles back. Listen, if the church doesn't go out and make contact with people in the world and form relationships and have an impact upon them and share the gospel with them, there will not be increase in the kingdom. I don't believe that anything is by luck or happenstance or coincidence. You realize somewhere in our surrounding area right now, someone this weekend or someone this week, probably for the first time, either in their life or in a very, very long time, had something that shattered their life, their heart, and for the first time, perhaps ever, 
They looked up toward heaven and they said, God, if there is a God, I need help. And I don't know what you want of me and I don't know how to pursue you. But I need help, God. Now think about this for a moment. The all-knowing God knew that that would take place forever ago. Now, if you were God, and I say that with all respect and reverence, and you knew that the only way individuals would be reached is for people in the church to make contact with them, what doors would you open and close to make sure that, you know that job that you applied for 20 years ago? And God knew 20 years later this weekend that that person that you've been working with would for the first time in their life start looking for Him? So what does God know? I need to make sure that I have a Christian in that office right there. Do you think it's just by happenstance that you live on the street you live on? I don't. I think God knew well in advance that there are neighbors around you that at some time would start looking for the Lord if you have relationships with them when they look for the Lord you can be that source to give them the good news. I don't believe your first block class is by accident. I believe that God has placed you in those classes so that when that co-student looks for the Lord, you'll be there. We've just seen it far too many times. And so the question is, are we making contact? How wonderful it is to be a part of God's family, but you realize our only relationships cannot be just with people and God's family. We have to have real, significant relationships with people out of His family. We have to be willing to walk through difficult times with them. And I don't mean just show up with a bouquet during difficult times and say, I did it! I'm talking walk with them for months and years during difficult times so that for the first time in their life, they can see Christ through us. So what's the first parable we read? God expects His church to grow. What's the second parable we read? God expects His church to grow through Christians, His church, making contact with others. Well, how would that ever take place? Look over in Ephesians 4, and I want you to notice how this is, and then we'll just have to give a, a brief outline, if you will, of something you may want to go back and study more if this appeals to you. In Ephesians 4, and verse 16, I'd like for you to notice, again, we're going to read here in just a moment what causes growth of the body. Let's just begin in 16, even though it's in the end of a sentence. He says, From whom the whole body, that's talking about the church, joined and knit together. That's talking about our relationship, how we are, are, are dependent upon each other. But what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share... That's huge. I'll do my part. You do your part. Our parts aren't the same. We don't have the same abilities. We don't have the same opportunities. But I do my part. You do your part. And what does it do? Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. I'm not saying there aren't other passages that teach us about how to grow a church. But what is significant to me is that this is the only passage that I know of in all the Bible where he literally uses the words. This is what causes growth a church to grow. That's powerful. And so you can just go back and look through the first 16 verses and he's just walking through and it's as if he's saying, remember the light and the bug? You want me to tell you what's attractive? In the first three verses of this fourth chapter, he says, having the right attitude is attractive. You want individuals to walk into this congregation for the first time and then make a second visit. What's required? Well, we just have to teach the truth. No, they don't know the truth. So that's not going to bring them back for a second visit. They don't know it. So if you teach it, they don't know it. If you don't teach it, they don't know it. So what brings them back for a second visit and a third visit so that you have the opportunity to teach them the truth? It's whether or not they see the love of Christ. Isn't it interesting, even in this passage... He doesn't start with doctrine. 
In this passage, he starts with attitude. In verse 2, he even talks about that humility and that gentleness and that long-suffering and that forbearing with shouldering up underneath the load. Can you help them carry their baggage? It really is true that people don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. And that's the order here. But now does that mean doctrine doesn't matter? Absolutely it doesn't mean that. Look at the next three verses. In verse 4, 5, and 6, we have the numeral 1 used seven times. Seven times he says, there's only one of these. In other words, the Lord is saying, there's not another option. You don't get to say, oh, but I don't want it that way. I'd like it this way. The Lord say, no, there's only one. He says, there's only one hope of the calling. You want to you go to heaven? There's only one way to go to heaven. There's only one hope of the calling. There is only one faith. There is, he starts out with only one body. There's only one church. There's only one baptism. And then he talks about the Godhead. There's only one Spirit, Holy Spirit. There's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. And there's only one God, the Father. And so wouldn't it be a shame if we brought more people into our pews but we didn't take the opportunity to teach them the right doctrine. We'd increase the presence on the pews, but we wouldn't increase the population of heaven. Now in verse 11 and 12, we see that we have to have the right leadership. And in verse 12, he explains that that leadership is going to help complete individuals. And that idea of perfecting or equipping goes over to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In other words, the leaders are helping individuals learn the Word of God better and it's not so they can be scholarly they're learning the word of god better he says right there in verse 12 for ministry in other words i hope you study your bible daily and if you do study your bible daily why i hope all of us would say i study my bible daily because i want to learn something every day or be reminded of something every day that i can go out and live today the word of god is written to live today and that's why leaders are to help everybody learn the Word of God better, to complete them, to equip them for ministry, to live a life of holding up the Lord as we go out to serve others. And then in the end of verse 12, he says, for the edifying of all. In other words, it's so that the church can be built up. But then as we close this, I'd like for you to notice that there's also a right kind of maturation the right kind of behavior and that is at the end of verse 13 notice he talks about that we're to grow in the stature and the fullness of jesus christ you see if we were to ask the lord hey will you evaluate our growth do you realize that he probably wouldn't start with well let's compare our numbers in attendance to last year's numbers let's compare our contribution with our budget Oh, we're doing so well. Look at this. We have a good attendance. We have a good budget that we're meeting. And we have a nice facility. We are doing so well. All those things can be a blessing. And there's a place to study and be concerned about all those things. But I think if the Lord was going to begin talking about the right kind of growth, it'd be language like this in verse 13, 14, and 15. See, 13, he says, if you want to talk about the growth... He says, back up against the wall and measure yourself spiritually. And then don't look left and right and measure at each other. Oh, look, I'm, I'm doing about like you. We're doing good. He says, no, measure in the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. So you measure yourself spiritually, and then you back up and you look. Okay, I'm right here, and Jesus Christ is right here. I don't think the Lord's doing that to discourage us. I think He's just showing us this is the maturation. I hope that I'm looking more like Jesus this year than I did last year, and I hope I look more like Jesus next year than I do this year. No one here has arrived. Everyone here has on a continual journey of maturation toward Jesus Christ if we're living the spiritual life as it's designed to live. And so are we growing in the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ? But notice verse 14, he says, Don't be children. Sometimes being a childlike is complimented in Scripture. But he's not complimenting it here. He's talking about you ought to be beyond the childlike knowledge. You ought to be moving to maturation. And so then in verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things. Listen to this. 
grow up in all things like unto him. See, he's, he's talking about growing again, and he's talking about growing like the head, Jesus Christ. When people look like Jesus, and they care for other people the way Jesus cared for other people, it's attractive. There's nothing that can replace growing to be like Christ when we talk about growing the kingdom. It's the right attitude that's like Christ's attitude. It's the right doctrine that comes from Christ. It's the right leadership that leads toward Christ. And it's everybody growing like Christ. And notice, and each one doing their share doing their part, does what? Causes growth in the body. That's attractive. Tonight, as we close, I just ask you to think about your life. And are you a reflection of Christ in all things? If you made a list of the roles in your life, school, work, family, civic groups, Circles of friends. Just made a list of everywhere that your life exists within those circles. Are you growing like Christ in those? Tonight, if you've never been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, that's the place to begin. If you're ready tonight to lay it all down before the Lord and surrender all, we would rejoice. The heavenly host would rejoice. If we can encourage you any way, we would do that at this time. Maybe you become a Christian. Along the way, you've been distracted, been apathetic. I'd ask you, are there individuals you pray for every day by name because you know they're lost? Do you use your relationships and your abilities to intertwine in a genuine way your life with them because you know they're lost? The lost will not be one until someone in the church makes contact with them and shares life and the Lord with them. Tonight, if there's anything that we can do, to help us walk closer to God, come as we stand, as we sing. Jesus.